Hi, Dr. Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Again, welcome to our combined series, both professional and patient series. Uh, today we're going to talk about scoliosis. Please remember that these videos are not supposed to replace visits with your doctor. If you have concerns, we're happy to see you here at area code 775-359-7111. Today we're going to talk about scoliosis, or curvature of the spine. Scoliosis is very common, and in fact, it's so common among adolescent girls that most states will require that the schools actually test the children or examine the children for scoliosis. Unfortunately, at least here in Reno, uh, our schools don't do a real good job of it. They both miss scoliosis and they falsely diagnose it many, many times. So if your school has said that there's a problem with your child, I wouldn't panic yet. You do want to be seen by your physician, be examined by a professional, and uh, that will often put to rest any fears that you have. What causes scoliosis? Well, there's lots of things that cause scoliosis. In particular, there's a type of scoliosis that's very common among newborns and infants and patients with neurologic disorders. We're not really going to talk about that type of scoliosis today. That's very severe and very dangerous and outside of the scope of this conversation. What we're talking about is what people refer to as idiopathic scoliosis or the typical scoliosis of adolescents. We usually see it come on during the uh, peak growth velocity, so that's at the time of the growth spurt for children. So for girls that's anywhere from 9 to 11 years of age most of the time, and for boys that's somewhere between 13 and 15 years of age. It's recommended that we, we as medical providers screen every patient annually during that time. Personally, I screen children during their well visits from the time they're old enough to stand up until their growth plates have completely fused at 18 years of age. So I maybe do more screening than is necessary, but because it's free of charge, it's not an additional charge on top of your well visit, and it takes but a second, it's well worth doing. The scoliosis curvature can progress over time. Curvatures of less than 30 degrees typically do not progress. Um, curvatures of more than 30 degrees risk progressing even after the growth plates have fused. So if you have a curve more than 30 degrees, you probably need to be followed. The child probably needs to be filed, followed by a spinal surgeon. Treatments depend on how severe the curve is and how young the patient is and how mature their skeleton is at the time that we pick the curve up. Uh, treatment can range anywhere from repeated spinal x-rays to monitor this, to bracing, to surgery. And you know, certainly we want to try to avoid surgery and many, many people will try bracing as a, a means of holding that surgery off or completely preventing surgery or minimizing the amount of surgery that has to be done. We're not going to get in how, into how, you, how the surgeons choose what kind of surgery or what kind of approach they're going to use. What, what, what I want to discuss here is the general pediatric approach to this, which is how we evaluate these children and how we determine who needs to then go on and see the spinal surgeon. Screening needs to be done both seated and standing, and seated is very important. If you have a leg length discrepancy, if one leg is shorter than another, it will falsely give you a positive forward bending test while standing, but when seated you eliminate that from the equation and is normal. However, the seated test is a little more difficult to do, so I recommend starting with the standing. In order to do this test in the real world, the child should be barefoot and not have a shirt on. Because this is a video for the internet, we're not going to use a child. <laughs> we're going to use one of my graduate students. She will have shoes on and uh, clothing, including a coat. Again, realize this is not how we would really do it, but for the sake of demonstration of the maneuvers, this is more than sufficient. So we're going to have Sarah come over for us, and I'm going to have you go just off to the side so that you're not, so you're going to face that way, so just lateral to the camera. Okay, feet need to go together. Okay, we're going to have you bend forward at the waist and just let your hands dangle. The examiner wants to stand behind the patient, sight down the spine, and make sure that it's straight. You're going to look at the shoulders and look for humps on the ribs. Okay, once you've done that, the patient can stand forward. 
Okay, and we can do it again seated. So we'll have you sit back on the stool, sit, have the patient sit way back, and you're not going to hit your head on the wall, are you? Okay, with their feet forward, and again, let your arms just dangle. Okay, and again, sighting along the spine, looking for discrepancies of the humps of the ribs. Okay, thank you. Now, there is a specific type of scoliosis that's very rare, called Schwerman's disease, wherein instead of curving sideways, you actually curve forward. That's a little more difficult to screen for, but Schwerman's disease is not something that we actually see in the typical adolescent girl. Uh, so it's not really part of idiopathic scoliosis and tends to have its own causes and its own pathology and is a lot rarer. So it's not something that you so much screen for as have to diagnose if a patient presents and, and you're concerned about Schwerman's disease. And again, that's outside of the scope of this video. So feet together, barefoot. Very important, you're not wearing shoes. Seated and standing both, especially the seated. The schools in particular are notorious for not doing the seated, and we wind up with a lot of diagnoses of minimal leg length discrepancy that's of no clinical importance, but enough to falsely test the child positive and panic people. I hope this has helped to demystify that for you a little bit in the diagnosis of scoliosis which is made a big deal in the school districts. Fortunately, it's rather rare, uh, but definitely something we want to screen for and common enough that it's worth testing or examining every child during their major growth phase. This is Dr. Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Again, we can be reached at 359-7111. That's area code 775. If you have questions, we're happy to see you. We'll see you next time.